you know, my mom would kill me if I didn't say that I'm still a dancer, once a dancer, always a dancer. We call BRC sort of the land of misfit toys, and I'm definitely a misfit <laughs> toy. <laughs> Not to toot my own horn, but, you know, there have been a number of people, I think, on our team. I think uh, BRC, we always struggled to talk about ourselves. Welcome to the Theatre Art Life podcast, and hello. We're putting the spotlight on those who create live entertainment around the globe, the culture creators and the backstage masters. My name is Anna Robb. And my name is Kat Landry. Welcome to our LDI special. In our LDI series, we will be speaking to some of the people who will be speaking or exhibiting at this year's LDI show running from November 14th to 20th at the Las Vegas Convention Center. Today, our guest is Maya Geis, the marketing director for BRC Imagination Arts. Maya has a unique set of skills that qualify her for one of the most challenging tasks at BRC, telling the story of a company that tells the stories of some of the most renowned brands, subjects, and places around the world. As marketing director, Maya oversees all brand communication and marketing-related activities. This requires that she sits at the intersection of teams and people using research and analytics to inform strategy, problem solve, and either build bridges or reinforce them. A Los Angeles native, Maya has lived and worked in London and Berlin. Before joining BRC, Maya consulted creative and design agencies on their business development and growth strategies. Maya received an MBA from the Drucker School of Management at Claremont Graduate University and her BA from Scripps College. Maya danced professionally for over 18 years, the highlight of which was an experience touring Africa as a cultural ambassador with the US Department of State. Maya, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. It's so exciting. I, I love that I read through all of this marketing bio and then I get to the end and you are you were a dancer. I just love that. <laughs> yes, in a past life. Yeah. So tell us about your beginnings. Obviously, you started as a performer in, in the arts. So your pathway to from being a dancer into being a market, marketing director. Help us join the dots. Yes, it's, it's definitely not a straight line. Um, yeah, I, I grew up dancing uh, professionally. My mom you know, bless her, put me in dance classes as, uh, as early as I remember, um, and she never let me quit. So that's what I did uh, for a number of years. I tap danced professionally. That was something that I got paid to do. I was at the right place at the right time and had incredible teachers. Some of the best tap dancers in the world um, just happened to be uh, in L.A. at the time. And then, yeah, I went to an arts high school. Uh, I did a lot of classical dance as well, contemporary and ballet. Um, but I got to a point where I just, being on stage didn't really bring me joy. I enjoyed everything leading up to the actual performance. And then I just started to hate the performance itself. I still have nightmares of being on stage and not knowing the choreography. But yeah, I think that knowing that and knowing that I enjoyed being behind the scenes and sort of understanding how certain events came to life because the two worlds weren't so separate. Um, Post-college, I started to organize a lot of just uh, local music events. Um, I had a couple of music series at restaurants and you know, we had a big music series here in Pasadena. So doing all of that, I realized, well, you know, if I, if I want to take this to the next level, I should probably study marketing. And so that's why uh, when I went back to business school to get my MBA, I had like a marketing and strategy focus. And the rest is history. I just started going around putting little, uh, putting the skills in my bag. I should also say that through dance and as a tap dancer, I danced with this company. Uh, we were perhaps the first and one of the only few concert dance companies. So even though we were tap dancing, we were performing on concert stages um, in New York and L.A. Uh, and Paris and just around the world. And through that, I became very close with lots of jazz musicians. You know, jazz was such a huge part of the tap dance experience. And so through that, we would go to jams. Almost every week, every Thursday night, there'd be the hang. People would gather. And I just loved this experience from, I mean, I remember being 12 years old and my mom would take me into the bar where the jam was happening. But inevitably, all these places would close. And so I sort of grew up thinking, well, I want my own place. I want my own hang. I want my own venue where my friends can come and jam and gather. And so uh, as I set off into the world post-college, at least, I just have always wanted to have my own home for jazz in L.A. It's something that the city desperately needs. And so I, I suppose you could say that I've just been gathering all the tools, like as long as it can help me develop this jazz club, I will do it. And so to that end, I say yes to lots of things. I've done a number of random things. And for some reason, marketing 
tends to be the thing I keep getting pulled back into. How does your experience as a dancer influence your work today? I know it's behind you in some ways, but are there certain skills or certain aspects of that that you carry into your job as a marketing director? Oh, absolutely. You know, my mom would kill me if I didn't say that I'm still a dancer, once a dancer, always a dancer. <laughs> but what I tell people is like one of the things I would say is that I think I'm fluent in the language of things that go unsaid. I think through dance, you become very well versed in body language um, and just sort of reading people. And so to that end, um, I just love watching people in conversation. Sometimes I think it's not so much what people say is how they say it, how you deliver a message. I also think, and this is something I didn't really, I I wasn't, um, I hated public speaking for a very long time. I hated the sound of my own voice coming through a microphone. But I think going to graduate school and you're sort of forced to give presentations all the time. And I realized, you know, I'm actually better than most people at this. And it's because I know how to put on a show. You know how to perform, how to stand up, how to use body language to pull people in, using eye contact, projecting your voice. So all of that, I think, definitely fed into um, what I do now, having to present and sell an idea to get people excited about a subject or a project. I also think something that I've learned this year, I've had to direct uh, some shoots for for work, you know, whenever we finish a big project, and I guess we'll get into what BRC does later, but we do these huge projects and we have to go and document the project for sales and marketing materials for the archive. Um, And that involves hiring a bunch of extras because we produce attractions, things that involve large groups of people in some instances. Um, And so I've realized that I have... uh, it was pretty easy for me when it came to directing movement, setting up a scene. How do you get people walking through and moving through a space in a way that feels natural? Um, And even just like directing people on maybe what gestures might uh, signify intimacy or that type of connection, the connection that we want to at least see and that we hope our guests have at our experiences. And so I think that there are a number of ways in which the dancing has helped me in my day-to-day as a marketer. I think that's really interesting and, and I think you you kind of underestimate if you've grown up in the arts or been surrounded by the arts, all of that ingrained training in you, right? And perhaps you experience it more than, say, us who are more in the industry. The, the reason that you realise that about yourself is when you see people who haven't had that training, right? So people are coming outside into your world and and they run events or something but they don't have that innate theatrical nature do you find that when you're comparing it because you would dance in and out of multiple realms in your in your job rather than particularly theatrical stuff that you're seeing people that have not had that background at all and that's a contrast and a highlight of your experience. Yeah. And I'll tell you now, I mean, working at BRC, there are a lot of ex-theater people, a lot of people that come from the theater because what we do in a way, it is the theater, you know, we're putting on a show. And so I think, you know, our team, we're so incredible. Like, you know, we have a number of people on our team that are really, really incredible at just engaging people. Right. And again, just like when you're in the room with the client, with the various stakeholders, like how you, again, how you excite people about this vision of the future, this shared future we're going to have together. A lot of it's also storytelling, right? We know how to tell a story uh, that hooks people. And so I, I can see it now 100%, just uh, just the energy, the camaraderie, and just the, the way that, you know, and a lot of the projects we work on, they're huge, integrated, global, like these are projects of scale. And so it takes a certain type of personality and energy to guide those types of projects. And um, yeah, I think that I can absolutely see the tie-in now. But yeah, I think a lot of people highly underestimate its value. Um, It's one of these sort of hidden, quiet things. It's a real soft skill that a lot of people have a hard time putting their finger on. But if you can excite people, you can do just about anything. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's amazing for those who might not know uh what is brc imagination arts and what do they do so uh, brc we essentially we work in the attraction space sort of the way i i've summarized it is we build large scale long-term immersive shows exhibitions we build large what we call brand homes or branded destinations essentially anything that involves bringing someone in 
telling them a story and sending them back out into the world with a new idea, a better understanding of a subject, a greater appreciation of a place. And so to that end, you know, it's it's really hard to talk about what BRC does because we do so many different things. There are so many applications for what I just said, you know, telling people a story. So, you know, we've touched almost every NASA visitor center in the U.S. We've worked on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame um, in Cleveland, Ohio. That's sort of an, an ongoing project and client of ours. Um, we just did the Las Vegas Raiders the Allegiant Stadium tours in Vegas. Um, So we'll do big stadium tours. And we did the tour experience at the Grand Ole Opry. And so it really runs the gamut. Um, You know, the Henry Ford Museum uh, in Detroit, we did the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum. But yeah, so the work we do, it, it really runs the gamut. I mean, it never gets boring either because we get to touch all these different subjects. You know, and one day I'll have a conversation about a panel discussion we're doing about the role of museums and the social justice conversation um, and certain how we talk about contemporary issues, right? Uh, in some cases, reframing history and, you know, how we want to tell the story of something that happened, you know, 100, 200 years ago, but in today's terms. Um, and then jumping to a call about, you know, again, a new sports experience or, it, you know, maybe we're doing something with beer, with whiskey. Uh, we do a lot with big uh, spirits companies, like we just finished Johnny Walker Princess Street, which is an eight story a department store size brand home complete with tours and experiences and tastings. We have a, there's a concert venue space. There's two restaurants, there's retail. It's huge. Uh, so again, like it just, just, it just never gets old, but we tell stories. That's what we say. One of the things that we say is that purposeful storytelling isn't show business. It's good business. And that's what we seek to, to uh, prove through everything we do. The variety must be amazing. And, and does the client, how do the, is it the clients come to you? Like, is it is is that the way that they're, they're finding you and they're looking for you to tell the story? Or is there a lot of uh, outreach to find those companies? It sounds like you've got a lot of work on. So how does that interface happen? You know, BRC has been around for 40 years. I think we're 41 now. But it, it's interesting because it's, and this is something that I had to really think about, you know, one of my first tasks when joining BRC was to do this whole rebrand and BRC's 40 year history, they never had a single point person on marketing. And so me really thinking about, well, who are we and to who to so say, so what and who cares, right? You have to answer those two questions. And so thinking about our audience, I mean, these uh, the projects that we do oftentimes, again, they're of such a scale that it's a once in a generation, right? A once in a decade project. And so when people are doing projects of this, again, of this scale, there are only so many companies that can actually do the work. And because of our 40 year history and simply because the projects we've done, the first project BRC ever did is a show called Impressions of Brands. It's at Epcot at uh, Walt Disney World in Florida, and it's still running every single day. So the projects we do, they work, the results, they speak for themselves. And because of that, we're sort of a trusted entity in this space. So Maya, can you tell us a little bit about the consulting that you were doing in London and Berlin before joining BRC? And what was kind of the path that led you here? Yeah, so how much time? <laughs> you said yeah. you know, two hours? <laughs> no, but um, I'll try and keep it short. But essentially, yeah, I mean, I was doing a bunch of music events. I was working freelance. I was working for a non an arts nonprofit here in LA uh, for a little while right after college. And I just started to really feel like a hamster on a wheel, working hard and going nowhere. And so I decided, as I said, to go back to school. And while I was at school, I got an internship um, at a company. It's called Caruso. At the time, it was called Caruso Affiliated, but now I think it's just Caruso. And uh, some people might know Rick Caruso. Um, He's running for mayor of LA, but he owns and operates the Grove, which is a big development here in um, LA, big retail space. And there's the Americana. And so something that he's done was bring uh, hospitality and luxury to the retail environment. He's also done that in the office, uh, like the office environment. But so I started working there and I had a mentor there that said, get out of here, go work in an agency. So when I graduated from with my MBA, I, I started working at an ad agency, a 360 agency that's here in, in Pasadena, which is unusual because um, 
I I love Pasadena, but there's not too much that happens here. But yeah, while I was there, I was I was doing I started on the account team doing influencer marketing. And then, uh, you know, I had met someone in school who lived in Germany. And so I'd always wanted to live and work abroad. And I thought, well, if I'm ever going to go, you know, if not now, then when? So I just decided to take that leap of faith and to, that's why I decided to move to Berlin. It was a personal decision. And as soon as I quit my job, the owner of the agency approached me and said, hey, I love Berlin. Take us with you. And so that's why I transitioned from a job sort of on salary on the team to being more of a consultant. I was doing lots of market research for them, essentially figuring out if you're going to move to and open an office here in Berlin, in Europe, what are you going to take? Is it going to be the social media piece? Will it be media? Will it be the influencer marketing? Um, Will it be the sort of broadcast work they do, creating large commercials? Um, And so my... After I did that research, I sort of transitioned onto their uh, team, essentially their business development team. They had a, a publication uh, where they would write about marketing and advertising and what was happening in the space. You know, instead of spending a lot of money on awards and other marketing efforts, they decided to produce a lot of thought leadership, which is smart. It's an interesting strategy. So I was working with the publication for a while, got laid off. I'm in Berlin. And I just happened to get lucky and someone else reached out to me and asked me to do a similar exercise for their agency. So that sort of kicked off this work I was doing with creative agencies, sort of looking at them at all angles, you know, figuring out who are you. And again, who cares, right? Especially in Mm. Europe. (laughs) So um, yeah, then I started working at at a design company in Berlin uh, as UX UI design company. So that gave me a whole different sort of point of view on just the design space and what's happening in design. It's a Japanese design company that had an office in Berlin. So that was a very interesting international environment. You know, you're working for a Japanese company in Germany and I'm having to translate all that. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And I'll tell you, there are 30 people on the team. I was the only person at that company that only spoke one language. Mm -hmm. Um, So it, you know, it's a real level set because as Americans, we tend to think we're in the center of the universe and we've got it all going on. And then you go other places and you realize people are a whole lot more well versed in just like culture as it applies to multiple environments, not just our own. So yeah, and then I was ready to come back to America. I started looking for jobs and this, it was like kismet. You know, I saw this job online for BRC. I thought, I, you know, this sounds interesting. I've never heard of this before. It's sort of in the realm in which I like to work. It was almost the exact same job I was doing in Berlin, doing, you know, marketing communications for a creative agency. Um, and it's been a perfect fit. You know, we call BRC sort of the land of misfit toys and I'm definitely a misfit <laughs> toy. <laughs> <laughs> and wow. how long what have you worked the... in at BRC? How long have you worked for them? Uh, I just passed my two year anniversary. Oh, lovely. I wanted to ask what what's like the back to BRC, what what's a day to day look like for a marketing director within BRC managing all these projects? What do you do day to day? It's interesting because creative agencies are funny little animals and they function a little bit differently just in terms of I think that the marketing, ha- having a marketing function at a creative agency, it's a real luxury. Um, not everyone, it's like because it's an overhead expense, right? And agencies have to be like accordions. You have to be able to shrink and expand at leisure as work comes in and out. It's very unpredictable, it can be highly volatile. And so, to that end, I'm a department of one. And that's something that I, you know, I both love and hate about the job. I sort of joke that I work with no one and everyone. And so, I touch everything that involves. BRC's voice going into the world. I touched, so as I said, I started doing it with the whole rebrand, um, coming up with just our whole met- messaging strategy. Who are we? What are we talking about? What is it we do? How do we describe the work that we do and in what context? And how does that sort of, how does that because how does that function dynamically in the various mediums and environments? Um, we did a whole website redesign. And so, I mean, I do all the social media. Every LinkedIn post was written and published by myself. <laughs> every Facebook post, every Twitter post, um, but also the press releases. We work with an ad, uh, uh, press 
uh, a PR agency, sorry. And so we work with them on that strategy. I'm getting a sort of earned media recognition and articles written about the work that we're doing. You know, all the awards, events, it just anything and everything, all the case studies, as I said, the documentation of our projects, which is my personal favorite part of the job, um, being able to sort of work on these shoots. But yeah, I mean, I touch anything and everything, all the con, any like content. We also have a podcast. I should shout that out. It's my <laughs> yeah, that's pod exciting. baby. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's funny that I've been making a podcast for a year, but this is my first time on a podcast. Um, but yeah, the podcast is called Masters of Storytelling, and I absolutely love it. I know that I'm biased, but essentially every episode I speak to um, a different storyteller, and they sort of talk about storytelling in their in the medium in which they work. So we've had lighting designers, a, a costume designer, someone that's developing a feature film for DreamWorks right now, you know, a branded entertainment consultant, a writer. And it's just so fascinating. I've just loved all these conversations. And so I abstract the conversations. It's not the pure interview. It's like I'm telling a story about the storyteller using their own words. Um, So yeah, it's called Masters of Storytelling. Everywhere you like to listen, subscribe, share. Totally looking that up. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds great. (laughs) So first of all, I just want to say how amazing I find it that you were so valued at your previous company that when you decided to move to another country they just went with you that's like the best (laughs) the best possible sign that you were doing a great job there possible Um, but I'm curious about in your role now um, this kind of department of one that you are do you find that to be more or less challenging than having a team because in some ways it's like you you have the autonomy of, of just being one person and being able to take things in a direction that you please. But on the other hand, you might not have as much support. I'm curious what that is like for you. Yeah, I, like I said, it's a blessing and a curse. And it's a bit nuanced because it also sort of speaks to the way that I like to work. I would say that in, in one respect, it's difficult because I have to think big and small all at the same time. And, you know, there's the big picture thinking the long-term planning. And again, just like being, having the wherewithal to like look up and say, okay, well, again, answer that question of who is BRC, right? That's, you know, (laughs) it's quite a big question, but there's also the small day-to-day things. Like, you know, when you're writing a blog article, what am I going to title the blog? What are the hashtags? What are the keywords? You know, what are the, uh, the subheaders? What are those, you know, all those little tiny questions. And like, if I'm going to put this in, you know, run and put some spin behind this article so more people see it again, like, how am I going to craft that? And so it's all the sort of micro creative decision making that happens. Um, and that can get very exhausting. It can also suck you in. So again, it's just like striking that balance of thinking big and small. I'm a generalist. Like I go wide because of just the variety of spaces I found myself in. I understand understand um, all the different facets of what goes into a marketing sort of program or what might qualify as marketing strategy and as a plan. But to that end, I you can only go so deep. There's only so much that I can do. Every idea I have, I have to go and execute on. And so that can also be a bit exhausting. It can be a bit frustrating also because, again, there's only so much I can do. So I don't have that... Uh, the type of scale I might have if, you know, we were working on a team. But uh, I also, I really enjoy the variety. If I had to do social media all day, I would absolutely hate my job. So it's like, you know, I can sort of sit and think about like, you know, how am I feeling today? Well, you know what? I feel like writing. I'm going to work on that blog article. Or you know what? I feel like doing something more tedious that we just go through and uh, organize you know, refresh our awards calendar and make sure that we're, you know, tidy there. Or, you know, I maybe I'll go work on this deck that someone needs. And so to that end, I can always do what feels right. It's very rare that I'm in a place where I just feel like I'm slamming my head into the wall because I don't want to do the task at hand. Is there a um, project or, um, yeah, is there a project that you're particularly proud of that you've done within BRC of all the variety that you've <laughs> taken on since you joined the company? 
<laughs> well, it's funny because it's like, you know, when I show my family BRC's work, they're always like, well, what did you do? What did you do? And I'm like, well, I didn't do any of this. <laughs> like, you know, so at least I can say that actually one of the, one of the projects that I'm very proud of on the team was a whole rebrand that we completed last year. And it culminated really in the website. Um, and we found out this week that the website actually, it just won an award for best homepage. Um, and so oh, that's nice. exciting that it's been recognized. Um, but yeah, that was a big project and it was a big sort of thinking task. Not to toot my own horn, but, you know, there have been a number of people, I think, on our team. I think uh, BRC, we always struggled to talk about ourselves because we're so many different things. It's like we felt like, well, if we describe ourselves this way, are we cutting ourselves off from this group? And if we describe ourselves this way, do we, are we no longer relevant to this group? You know, when we're talking about museums, you don't really want to be talking about brands. And when you're talking about spirits experiences, it's a, you, you don't want to be talking about something that might be a, a children's experience. You know, we do the VIP, but we also do the broad general interest. And so it was how do we like find that like the lowest common denominator, the thing that's true across everything that we do and start from there to build up. So we don't feel like we're changing all the time, but we're, we're always the same. We're BRC. We're the same everywhere we go. But here's something that might be most useful or applicable to you. So um, just having to think through all these like sort of questions and answer these things about the BRC voice and um you know, again, visually, what colors sort of speak to our aesthetic. A tone I really wanted to strike with BRC was how do we appear professional? And like, you know, we know what we're doing, but also like fun and playful. And so like striking that chord of something that felt, uh, yeah, friendly, but not overly so, not childish. And so, yeah, there are all these different little creative challenges and it feels good now. I mean, again, it's only been two years, but you know, the, the the groundwork, the foundation that we set last year, it's holding. It feels good to constantly be able to go back and say, well, again, does this prove the point that purposeful storytelling is in show business, it's good business? Like that sort of holds as it, the, just the, uh, the core of everything we seek to prove and communicate um, and share. Well, that's really interesting. So you're going to be speaking at uh, LDI this year and uh, tell us what session you're going to be jumping into and, and what you're going to be doing there. Yeah, I'm very excited. Uh, we'll be hosting a session called Lighting Johnny Walker's 200-Year Legacy. Um, I'll be moderating, but with uh, Christian Lachelle, who's our creep our chief creative officer, he was the creative lead on this whole what's called Destination Scotland project with our client Diageo. And Diageo is a an alcohol the spirits holding company um so they own a lot of different brands but working with them on johnny walker this was a part of a 185 million pound investment they were making in the whiskey tourism industry in scotland so it was massive we just completed it um so johnny walker was one of many distilleries whose visitor experiences we transformed and redesigned um but it's also, I'll be joined by uh, Manny Treason. He's a principal at NYX Design, and he was the lead lighting designer on the project. And Kurt Schnabel, who's a design engineer with Clear Wing Systems Integration, who was, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm making this up a little bit, but he was, I'll call him the chief sort of technician on the project, making sure that everything worked and all the systems were a go. So, yeah, I'm really excited to be to be speaking with the three of them on just the, the the project and sort of, you know, design, lighting design's role in the contemporary retelling of Johnny Walker's legacy and how we were able to use lighting design um, in this process of immersive storytelling and in the building of interactive experiences and really in the performance art. Uh, there are real people performing at uh, this at this brand home and so it's exciting that it feels so interdisciplinary and to see everything working together so seamlessly is just so exciting okay so maya at the end of each podcast we ask the same two questions the first one is what do you like the most about your job and about the industry as a whole the people i think that it doesn't matter what kind of creative agency you're working at or in, in the creative industries in general. I think that's something that people always say that they love, love, love the people. Yeah, I agree with that. That's a very common answer actually within the industry. So <laughs> we all know what, we all know why we're here, which I think is uh, great. Good. If you yeah, could, I was right. If you could change 
Yeah, exactly. If you could change one thing about your job or the industry, what would that be? Well, I think the change that we all seek, it's starting to happen and hopefully we see more and more and more of it, which is just the different voices telling their unique, specific, nuanced, niche stories. I think that, you know, something that comes up a lot in at least you know, the podcast we do at BRC is just the notion that, you know, just when you think that all stories have been told, there are a myriad of stories that have never been heard by general audi- by the general audience. And so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to just continuing to hear these stories and to meet these storytellers. And, you know, there's so much that, that can be gained from everyone's experience. Like, you know, I learned so much through even my friends. And so, I, again, like I'm just, I'm just looking forward to seeing what's next. That's amazing. I agree. Um, it's an interesting time in the industry, especially post-COVID, and uh, it's good. I'm going to see you. I'm going to come find you at LDI because I'll be there as well. So I'll make I sure that I so. come to your session and and meet you in person. And we wish you the best with BRC and um, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks so much, Anna. Please do me a favor. Yeah, no matter how bad the panel is, just tell me it was great. <laughs> it's all right. I'll be cheering from the background. <laughs> No, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Maya. Theater at Life is a global media site for entertainment. Memberships start at only 38 US dollars per year. You can have unlimited access to our daily published articles, including entertainment news and the writings of active industry professionals, ensuring that you are always up to date on the global happenings in the world of entertainment. Become a part of the international entertainment community and join us now at www.theaterartlife.com.